I want to pivot a little bit here to some other things that you've been covering. There's a lot of power concentrated in multilateral organizations, for lack of a better term. And, you know, we saw that in the WHO, how much influence WHO ha can have, how easily the Chinese Communist Party can, you know, co-opt some of these organizations. You've been looking at the World Economic Forum, um, you know, and this is kind of a nice, a nice segue because you have a piece about, you know, how, how to get in, right? You need to be triple vaxxed, you need to be narrative compliant, you need to pay over $100,000 and you're in. Right. So, that, so that's interesting. Right. So what, what, what is it that you found here? So for people who are unaware what the World Economic Forum is, in my view, today it has become the, the chief. It's like a think tank for the ruling class. So if you've heard the slogan, build back better, great reset, the infamous you will own nothing and be happy line. Those are all narratives that came from the World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum is enormously influential because it's the place where these rulers, elites, come to share all of their ideas and decide on these bumper stickers. And the World Economic Forum is a radical, I think, climate-focused organization. They, they're like very scorched earth. They want to take everyone's property rights, make you eat bugs and soy, and uh, remove all the cows and all the healthy things from society and have this managerial elite class uh, completely control everything in society. This is an enormously influential organization. They hold an annual confab in Davos where they go and meet and share ideas and it's a very exclusive club. You cannot get into the club unless you apply for membership, organizational membership, very costly. Uh, most organizations on the private side, so these are big corporate sponsors, will pay anywhere from sixty to $600,000 once they're accepted. And remember, this is like a narrative policing organization similar to you know, the ESG movement or some of these big movements that if you are allowed in Davos, you have already conformed to the Davos agenda, which is very smart. What's interesting in those articles I've been publishing in the dossier is the media collaboration and that the media is also, whether it's the New York Times, CNN, Reuters, Wall Street Journal, they're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to the World Economic Forum so they can be part of this annual meeting, so they can interview you know, the CEO of BlackRock and Bill Gates and Albert Bourla of, of Pfizer and whatnot. So they kind of become complicit in this agenda because they are now partners and members to the World Economic Forum. And it just speaks to a totally broken and corrupt press that we're dealing with today. And I think we're definitely operating. There are people who operate on the inside, who are part of that insane agenda. And then there are real journalists who operate on the outside and want to actually speak truth to power, who don't want to go to these um, cocktail parties and confabs and Davos, which costs which, which only people of wealth and status can even get into. And it just breaks all of the rules of traditional journalism. So the, the, I find the World Economic Forum to be one of the most prevalent threats to a free society today because they are very good at gathering the elites, getting them to agree on one set or a couple of particular narratives. I think it's very clear what their agenda is Klaus Schwab, the president of the World Economic Forum, has written like four books in the past two years, and it's always the same message. It's always this you will own nothing and be happy thing. So he wants to co-op corporations into this green, this green New Deal, this green transition stuff, this, this ESG compliance. We live in an era of censorship and disinformation, and it can be really hard to know what's true and what's false in this information climate. To get honest information and insights you can trust, join us on Epoch TV. You can sign up for your 14-day free trial at ept.ms slash free trial Jan. That's ept.ms slash free trial J-A-N. And government, government partners, he has been leveraging the COVID situation to also try to radically transform society, you know, this, this builds back better, great reset stuff that they have been trotting out. 
this is all about radically reorienting society. And what's interesting is that Schwab in his books singles out American society, especially Americans who believe in individual li liberty and personal freedom. He views these people as the greatest threat to his organization's agenda. And I think that's an enormous badge of honor for the Americans who oppose this stuff. It's very much a collectivist outfit. They want to take away our rights, decide what food we eat, decide where we can travel. They, if you recall these, these Australian lockdowns where they, they set up a radius where Australians were allowed to travel, what they were allowed to do, go to the supermarket, what they were allowed to, you know, what kinds of uh, socializing they were allowed to do. This is like the dream for these folks of the World Economic Forum, and they're openly endorsing it. So for me, that, for what, what I saw with half these lockdowns, that's, that, that to me is a form of human enslavement. It, they, they have no rights, and it, you know, it showed to me the importance of uh, being a, an American who stands for individual liberty and the importance of advancing the liberty movement and even the importance of something such as like gun rights in America. Um, I think one of the reasons that it frustrates like the, these European and just global elites is that we have this dang thing called the, the Second Amendment and, they, and even our federal government, like they know that they'll have a tough time pushing us around in, in Florida and Texas and places where a lot of people take seriously their right to self-defense and their right to protect against an authoritarian government. Um, and America seems to be one of the few places in the world left where you can um, defend yourself with, with those rights. And, and you know, one of the reasons why Australia and New Zealand and Canada and the UK, which have a similar cultural heritage to the United States, one of the reasons why they just totally went along with that crazy COVID agenda where they stole everyone's rights overnight is they really had no means to defend themselves and the government knew that. So people have criticized this, uh, you will own nothing and you will be happy. And, and the response has been to this and actually multiple other, you know, sort of policy recommend or policy ideas, policy recommendations has been precisely that. Oh, this isn't our, we're, this isn't what we're endorsing. This isn't what we're saying has to happen. This is, these are just some ideas. We're looking into the future that this is what we're about. You know, the way I think about it is that's their defense. But similar to that, I just had a recent conversation with an epidemiologist who said kind of the same thing about her profession and and the next thing you know is COVID happens, all of these virologists, so-called public health experts, they're supposed to be in this advisory role. And next thing you know, these like county, federal, state directors are responsible for shutting down society. So very quickly, they go from the advocacy to the direct action approach. And that's what, when, when these folks are telegraphing what they want for society, I think it's way more than an advisory role. They are actively working on installing these type of regimes and governments, and they've had a lot of success. Mm -hmm.